Good morning, church. Welcome to you this morning. I'm glad you're here. If this is your first time or first time in a long time, I want you to just take a deep breath, uh, relax. We at Generations, we don't want anything from you today, but we do want something for you. We want you to know the peace and refreshment that comes from experiencing the grace of God in the midst of his church. Amen? Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 27, as Pastor Jeff said. And whenever we jump into a text, I like to set kind of the content of the book we're going to be in and the context of the specific passage. And so you'll remember we're in a series in Isaiah called Our God Saves. And the content of the book of Isaiah is all about the prophecies and promises of a man named Isaiah who was himself a prophet. There we go. Just want to make sure you guys are listening. No trick questions this morning. And if you remember correctly, a prophet simply teaches God's truth with God's authority to God's people. And so Isaiah has been doing that for 26 chapters thus far. The first uh, third of the book will cover the promises prior to the people's exile when God sends them out. Then he will speak prophecies and promises to the people while they are in exile in chapters 40 through 55. And then he will conclude the book with prophecies and promises for the people as they return home. That's the content of the book of Isaiah. For us this morning, our specific context is going to be Isaiah 27, in which Isaiah is going to deliver a prophecy and a promise to God's people using poetic language concerning God's reprove of his judgment for them. It is God lifting his hand of discipline and promising a future day of blessing and restoration for his people. We're going to see that God uses discipline to ultimately love, care for, and bring his people back to himself. So if you have your Bible open or your fake Bible on your app, I'm going to invite you to stand with me for the reading of the word. This is something we do uh, not out of ceremony or tradition, though we certainly could, but rather we do this out of worship. We stand giving our attention to God, knowing that when we open our text, that God, using his spirit, will clear our minds, will make ready our hearts, and ultimately, through his truth and power, will transform our lives. Amen. And so with a clear mind, a ready heart, and a willing spirit, would you hear the word of the Lord beginning in Isaiah chapter 27. In that day... The Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. I would burn them up together. Or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Has he struck them as he struck those who struck them? Or have they been slain as their slayers were slain? Measure by measure, by exile, you contended with them. He removed them with his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the, will, this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin when he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces. No asherim or incense altars will remain standing. For the fortified city is solitary, a habitation deserted and forsaken. Like the wilderness, there the calf grazes, there it lies down and strips its branches. When its boughs are dry, they are broken. Women come and make a fire of them, for this is a people without discernment. Therefore, he who made them will not have compassion on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. In that day from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day a great trumpet will be blown. And those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord, church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for the beautiful promises contained today. I pray that you'd help me to deliver your word carefully and clearly to your people. That as Pastor Jeff has already prayed, God, that you would forgive me of my sin and weaknesses and the places where I grow weary and that you would step forward. 
that Holy Spirit, you would teach us what we know not, you would give to us what we have not, and you would form in our character and our soul that which we are not. We ask this, God, to your glory and our good, through the power of your Son, Jesus, amen. Amen. Would you have a seat? So I'm an Apple guy. Uh, I have been uh, very early on uh, in ministry. I had the uh, privilege of getting an Apple computer handed down to me, and just from since then, I've been ingrained in it, so much so that I run my life by the calendar application called iCal. Um, I'm pretty dogmatic about it. I, I, I calendar everything. Early on in leadership, I learned something called time budgeting, where I want to tell my time how I'm going to spend it. I, I'm such a freak about making appointments and setting dates that my wife and I even fight about it. See, I don't forget things. I defend myself with this. Did you put it on the calendar? <laughs> Gives me an excuse not to listen. But here's the trouble with that. When it comes to the, to the future that God has planned, unfortunately, he has not sent me an email invitation to the day that he speaks of here in Isaiah 27. In fact, as you heard me read the scripture, you'll hear the phrase, on that day, several times, or in that day. You see, the day that God is talking about through the prophet Isaiah here is a day that would culminate in future blessing and relief from the discipline of his hand upon his people. Remember, the book of Isaiah is a book of prophecies and promises that stem because the people forgot God. They began to look for pleasure and identity and security in other things and other false idols and false gods. Therefore, the Lord had to discipline them. He will discipline the nation of Israel with the Assyrian kingdom coming in and essentially wiping them out. And it will discipline the southern kingdom of Judah with the Babylonian exile. That is, they will come in, they will destroy the city, and then they will take the people into captivity for 70 years. It is here in Isaiah chapter 27 that God gives a beautiful promise that one day the discipline with which he is disciplining his people will relent. We might consider our passage today on multiple levels. We might consider what it says in its historical context. What did it mean for the people who were reading it in their day, in their time in history? We might consider how Jesus came in the first century and fulfilled some of the promises spoken about. And then, too, we might even consider it in accordance with the future promises that God has yet to fulfill. And so as we make our way through this text, I want you to think about what would it be like to be in the nation of Israel or in the nation of Judah under the discipline of the Lord to hear this passage read to you or to hear these promises spoken to you? What it must have been like to be a first century Jew and, and see Jesus come and begin to inaugurate the spiritual kingdom of God that would last forever. And then what it means for us today, living in 2019, looking forward to the day when God will ultimately wipe away every tear from our eye and all pain and sorrow and the discipline even that God uses in our life today will be completed. Here's my big idea. The grace of God creates beautiful transformation in his people. The grace of God creates beautiful transformation in his people. It might also read, if you will, the discipline of God creates beautiful transformation in his people. I would consider discipline an act of grace, but I'll get into that. The grace of God creates beautiful transformation in his people. Let's jump in. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. In that day, there's that phrase again, right? I looked my calendar, I cannot find it anywhere. I don't know when it's coming. In that day, it has come from the nation of Israel in its historical context. It came when Jesus began to inaugurate the spiritual kingdom of God. Yet for us, this day also holds a future context, one in which God will do what he's accomplishing. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword. Think about the sword of the Lord. Isaiah gives us three adjectives. It is a hard sword, which means it is not easily broken. It's not like those cheap things you buy at medieval times. Okay, this thing is not going to break. It is a hardened steel. It is set forth for the task that it, 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 which it shall accomplish, and it will not be broken. It is a great sword, which means it's not a short sword. It's not for up-close, one-on-one fighting. No, this is a great, broad sword that is meant to take a great big swipe and destroy that which it is levied against. And it is a strong sword. It has no equal. 
With this hard, great, and strong sword, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Anyone brave enough to see the new movie Crawl? No? Good. Me neither. Okay, I don't do scary movies, mostly because there's no one to come and tuck me in at night. Like, I just don't. All right? You leave, that's, a, that's not a bad idea. Um, Leviathan here probably means, in its original context, probably like a great big crocodile, some kind of great big serpent. It might even be dragon, if you will. Again, Isaiah is a prophet, which means he is free to use poetic imagery to deliver the promises of God. That's one of the things he's doing here. So what Isaiah is telling the people in its context is on that day that is coming, the Lord will use his hard, great, and strong sword to punish the evil dragon or serpent. We're told that the serpent is a fleeing serpent. That means he's running scared from the Lord. In addition, we're told in verse 1 that it is a twisting serpent and that God will slay that dragon that is in the sea. The word sea, S-E-A there, it is typical among apocalyptic language or poetic, figurative, prophetic language to be that of humanity. So Isaiah is using a word picture here. He uses a crocodile or great dragon or lizard that emerges from the sea that is full of evil here. This is a great symbol of Satan, his forces, and his influences. And on the day that Isaiah describes here, Satan's influence in the world will be destroyed. God's people today, because of the cross of Christ, are set free from bondage to Satan and the false gods he seduces the people of the world to worship. We rejoice in Jesus' victory greatly. But for Isaiah and the people of his day and the neighboring nations around Isaiah, Satan held these nations in bondage through fear, through their superstitious religions. And what Isaiah is promising is that the remnant of God's people did not, near to, did not need to fear the false gods of the neighboring nations, for there would be a day when God would destroy them. When the battle would be over, when the Lord had conquered evil, the people of God could enter glorious kingdom without fear. For us living today, it is the cross of Christ that ensures this victory for us. Amen. What Isaiah prophesied, Jesus has secured and will one day be the reality for all eternity. We know this from passages like Colossians, excuse me, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 15, which read, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So this is our condition before Christ. God has made alive, this is God infusing the Spirit into our soul, together with him, him being Christ, and have forgiven us all our trespasses. Verse 14, by, here's how Jesus did that. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And then verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. See, what Christ accomplished on the cross was not just the forgiveness of our sins, but the conquering of any influence that Satan might have among God's people. The author of Hebrews continues in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, when he says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise took partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Did you pick up what the author's laying down there? That one day, through the resurrection of Christ, Death and its power and fear will be freed from God's people. The promised blessings that Jesus has secured that the author of Colossians and Paul and the author of Hebrews speak about that are upon us, Isaiah promised on a future day would come. One day would Satan and his influences would no longer have power anywhere in God's creation. For us as the church, those who are covered under the cross of Christ, we experience freedom from Satan's devices. Let me give you kind of the three that I think Satan uses typically to influence us that God has defeated for us. Satan's ability to deceive, distract, and discourage believers has been defeated by Christ. See, Satan will seek to deceive you. The scripture tells us that Satan is the father of lies, and so he will seek to keep you confused and deceived by lying to you. This has been his first trick going all the way back to where? Genesis 3. When he told Eve, hey, if you disobey God, you won't surely die. False. Yeah. 
Additionally, Satan will seek to distract you. He is the great tempter, after all. And so he will lift up uh, those pleasures and, and parts of society that might lead you away from God and finding full satisfaction in Christ. He will seek to tempt you to sin. And then finally, he will also discourage you. He is also called in Scripture the great accuser. If you hear statements that are you statements, what I mean is that when you feel uh, a, a negative sense of self-worth, when you hear statements like, you are not worthy, or you are unclean, or you have failed, know that those are not from the Spirit and not from God, but rather from Satan, the great accuser. Jesus has brought the kingdom to bear upon this world. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And in the day of the Lord, which Isaiah prophesies about here, the final destruction of evil will be complete and its influence will be no more. For now, we as the church live in freedom in a world that is still enslaved. But one day, all will be freed. The picture of the great and terrible evil here and God's great, strong, and mighty sword is a poetic language used to demonstrate a great spiritual truth that one day the nation of Israel would be freed. It has been in historical context. What Isaiah prophesied about came to bear. Jesus came and has accomplished the spiritual beginning of God's kingdom forever as he inaugurated it in his ministry through his life, death, and resurrection. And we now wait the full culmination of it when God will renew all of creation and we will no longer have any memory of Satan's influence. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's continue. Verse 2. In that day, there's that phrase again. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. Isaiah continues the use of poetic language here by once again returning to the image of a vineyard for the nation of Israel. This was used in chapter 5 previously. If you remember all the way back in Isaiah chapter 5, at that time Isaiah's prophecies about God's people as a vineyard, however, were God's judgment upon them. Now they're going to convey restoration and protection, both from enemies without and within. Isaiah chapter 5 reads this. God's original uh, a prophecy about his people and the vineyard. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. In chapter 5, Isaiah uses the poetic imagery of a vineyard to describe God's people and what we're told is that God looked for justice and mercy amongst his people. That is, he looked for them to honor him. He looked for them to behave in a manner worthy of the calling in which he had given them. But rather, he found nothing but idolatry and evil among them. And so as a good gardener pulls weeds from his garden, God was going to discipline the vineyard. Hence, we begin chapter 6 all the way through chapter 26. And we get back here to chapter 27 and we get God's reprieve. The vineyard, once again, is God's people. But here the prophet sees both Israel of his day and the Israel of the future when the king will be established forever. In chapter 3, or excuse me, in verse 3, Isaiah mentions two ways that God is diligent about keeping the garden. We're told that he waters it every moment and that he will defend it against the attacks of robbers and cattle and any other annoyances that would seek to trample his people. There are two things chiefly required to keep a vineyard strong, cultivation and protection, and here God promises both of them. My wife and I recently planted uh, roses in our backyard. Uh, we live in the area of the high desert, so we get the triple digit heat, and we set these roses along the, kind of the backside of our property, but they were getting fried in the sun. And what we spent a lot of money on, what was very expensive, we put in a place of vulnerability, which caused us to have to trim all of these things back almost to the bare root and move them to a new place. See, they lacked protection and cultivation initially, and so they did not thrive. But since we've moved them, since we began to make, pay attention to them, water them, protect them from the harshness of the sun by making sure they get some shade during the day, guess what? Now we've got new blooms on our roses. The same is going to be true of God's people. God had allowed 
these false idolatry, this unrighteousness to be crept into his place, and therefore he had to discipline them. But now he promises to provide all that is necessary for them to flourish and grow. It says that he'll water, that is, he will provide the conditions that are necessary to flourish and receive life. He promises to protect them. The church of God is God's vineyard. And so if we are to flourish and bloom, we need to recognize that we will owe everything to God who is our constant caretaker. Amen? Amen. That God is doing the things that are necessary both in the nation of Israel in the context of history through Christ and even now today, he is doing those things necessary in our midst to produce life. Some of that might mean discipline. There are some things that God might need to cut away from you in order to produce greater life. But what you can be assured of is that just as the vineyard was God's people in Isaiah's day, that we are his vineyard today, that God will protect us and he will produce life. How do we know this? Verse 4. I have no wrath. Underline that for a minute. I have no wrath. Isaiah is speaking the promises and prophecies of God over his people in first person. So hear the voice of the Lord in regards to his people. I have no wrath. Would you just allow the peace and the affection of God to wash over your soul for just a minute when you consider that God has no wrath toward you? I think far too often we minimize the cross in that context. When we become so overwhelmingly aware of our sins and our failures that we begin to be afraid of God. That perhaps we have sinned so greatly that God's wrath might be rekindled against us. And then we begin to map out our life in front of us and we begin to wonder, well, which, which tragedy or which difficulty in my life has been sent to me as punishment from God? So then we begin to fall into religious math. Well, I screwed up a whole lot, so now God's punished me with this bad circumstance, so maybe if I do a whole lot of right, God will remove it and return the blessing to me. Let just verse 4 correct your thinking. I have no wrath, declares the God of the universe over his people. Listen to this. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. Here's what God's saying. Right now the vineyard is pure. It is clean. It is mine. I will invite briars and thorns to come in so that I might squash them, so that I might further prove to the people that I love them, that I'm here to protect them, that I'm here to cultivate them and produce life. I would burn them up together, declares the Lord. Or he says, let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me with me. God invites even the enemies of his people to be at peace with him. And again, on this day that Isaiah talks about occurs in the course of context of history. Christ inaugurates the spiritual kingdom and for us remains to be true. If you came in this room an enemy of God, if somebody dragged you here, God invites you to make peace with him this morning. He has made the way through the cross of Christ. And he invites you to leave entirely differently. No longer in fear of him, but in deep friendship with him. That's how God was going to treat his people. He was not angry with his people any longer. He just yearned for them to return to him and fervently trust him. You know what this tells us? That all of the judgment we've read about... All of the discipline that God had upon his people thus far in Isaiah was not an act of a capricious, angry God, but was the act of a loving father to discipline his children. God used war from Assyria to punish the northern kingdom and captivity with Babylon to discipline the southern kingdom, but he did this in love, not anger. Listen to Jesus' own words about a church who had gone wayward in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Those whom I love, declares Jesus himself, I reprove and discipline. 
So be zealous and repent. See, God uses suffering as a discipline in the context of our lives in order to bring us to, into submission to Him so that we will continue to seek Him and His holiness. God moves to a time when His discipline will relent and the people will flourish here in Isaiah 27. Further, verse 4 reminds us that if God has called us, we may always conclude that He is not angry with us. And that having embraced us with a firm and enduring affection, it is impossible that he shall ever deprive us of it. God assumes the character of a father who is grievously offended. And who, while he is offended at his children's behavior, still more loves them and is naturally inclined to discipline them and exercise compassion because the warmth of his love as a father rises above his anger. That is your God this morning through Christ. Having assured his people that the day of his discipline will relent and he is the great vineyard keeper who will cultivate life among them, he continues to speak of a future time of blessing. Verse 6. In days to come, Jacob shall take root, and Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Jacob and Israel are a reference to the nations, the founding fathers of the nation of Israel, Jacob. And what Isaiah speaks of here is a day when the nation that has been disciplined, the nation nation that has been destroyed by war and captivity, one day they will put forth shoots. That is, they will blossom once again. And listen to this. They will fill the whole world with fruit. That is, the entire world will be blessed by this vineyard that God has planted. This is no doubt an allusion to the continued promises that God gave to the Abraham, that one day his descendant would lead to a family that is more innumerable than the grains of sand and than the stars of the sky. Friends, brothers and sisters, you sit here today as a Christian bearing the fruit of Jacob and Israel through the cross of Christ. That Jesus himself accomplished this. That he is the shoot that bears fruit. That is the church. That is the culmination of God's people that will affect the whole earth Ultimately, in conclusion, on that future day when the whole earth is renewed under the grace of God. Verse 7, God continues. Has he struck them as he struck those who struck them? That's an interesting phrase and question. Here's what Isaiah is getting at through this prophecy. is He's asking the people of God to consider, and those who would read his words consider, has God struck his own people as severely and as um, comprehensively as he has, will strike down their enemies? This is a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course, no. That God's discipline for his people will not be as severe as the coming judgment for the enemies of his people one day. Verse 7 continues, Or have they been slain as their slayers were slain? Again, the answer is no. Verse 8, Measure by measure, by exile you contended with them. He removed them with his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. Again, that's an allusion to the eastern nations coming through and disciplining God's people. Therefore by this, that is therefore by the discipline of God, listen, by the discipline of God, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. So here's what Isaiah is getting to. God's discipline has not been as harsh as his punishment for the enemies of God's people will be, but rather through the discipline of his people, their sins have been atoned for through the actions of God. God himself uh, takes issue with our sin, and then he himself atones for our sin through his own action. Now here is the, the fruit of that discipline. Look at verse 9. Therefore by this, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the fruit of the removal of sin. How will we know the people's sins have been removed and they've been atoned for? Listen, when he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones. Again, what was one of the great sins of the people of God? 
They began to worship false gods. How do we know they began to worship false gods? Because they take stones and they built up altars so that they could offer sacrifices to gods who were not gods. What does God say will be the fruit of their repentance? That God himself, through the actions of his people, will take those stone altars and reduce them to chalk dust. How do you know you have been influenced by the grace of God when we can look at your life and the former idols you used to worship are nowhere to be found. Because the beautiful winds of God, God's grace have blown them away like chalk dust in the wind. We're told they will be crushed to pieces. No ashram or incense altars will remain standing. The formal ways of your former life before Christ have been crushed and are now gone. This is the effect of the discipline of God. Is our idols are crushed and reduced and expunged from our life. Verse 10. For the fortified city is solitary. Again, Isaiah loves to use poetic language. It's part of prophecy. It's a part of apocalyptic language. Again, he's speaking about a future day that was in history, inaugurated at Christ, and will future one day come. I want you to notice the... Um, the comparison here, God's people is pictured as what in Isaiah 27? What's the metaphor? What's the word picture? A what? A vineyard, right? So here now we're, we're, we're changing word pictures. What are we looking at now? Verse 10? City. Fortified city. These two illustrations, a vineyard and a fortified city, might be compared to the kingdom of God as a vineyard and the kingdom of man as a fortified city. Man taking his own strength his own confidence and his ability to fortify himself against God. We're going to see how that works out. Verse 10. For the fortified city is solitary, a habitation deserted and forsaken like the wilderness. That is, all the schemes and plans that man has built to contend with God have now been laid bare, and it's like a wilderness out there. If you've seen any kind of apocalyptic zombie movie or show lately, and you see the survivors kind of walk through the city, and you see like the trees and the plants have grown up around the buildings and the structures of men, have that mental image here. That all the schemes that we would create as human beings to contend with our Creator are laid bare and wasted under the judgment of God. There, verse 10 continues, calves graze, that animals just graze freely among the city of men. There it lies down and strips its branches. That is, the cow is living and making himself at home. When its boughs are dry, they are broken. Women come and make a fire of them, for this is a people without discernment. This is a people who do not discern the creator. This is a people who give no thought to God. This is a people who look at their life and the summation of it and give themselves credit. They have no discernment of God or the creator. Therefore, because they do not discern the creator, therefore he who made them will not have compassion on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. We have seen in this passage God's judgment of evil and its influences in Leviathan. We now see God's judgment upon people who have no regard for God. This is the fate of the nation in, in Israel's day who will not divine or discern God. This is the fate of the people who rejected Jesus at his time. It will be the future fate of those who reject Jesus now. This passage just gives us wonderful encouragement toward the grace of God, but it also gives us terrible warning about our fate if we will not acknowledge him. That all the schemes, all the plans, all the things you would build up and fortify yourself with against God will one day be laid to waste and bare. In one circumstance, people who will come to know God will be forgiven of sins, abandon their worship of false gods, but the people in the fortified city who never come to truly discern and know God, their sinfulness will lead them to destruction. They will experience the Creator with no compassion. God will not speak over them, I have no wrath, but rather declare, I am justice. Verse 12, 
In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain, and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. This is, too, a beautiful promise that we can see on the three layers. This is a promise that God kept in the historical context. If you've read uh, the book of Nehemiah or heard Pastor Jeff preach about it or talk about it, that day is described here in verse 12. When all those who are scattered by God in war and in captivity will be gleaned, that is, they will be brought home and restored. That day happened in the context of history. It is a day that exists in the midst of Jesus. He gathers his people to himself and then sends the disciples out as what? Church planters. Who are going to do what? Plant seeds and harvest who? The people of God. We continue in that vein today as we invite people to come to know Jesus. We are inviting people to be gleaned from the world, harvested for God. Verse 13, and in that day, there's that phrase again, In that day, a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria, and those who were given out to the land of Egypt, will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. I love the language that those who were lost and those who were driven out. Those who were sucked into the confusion and chaos of the time will be brought home and given clarity and direction. Those who were driven out by others, those who, who were, were pushed to the outside and, and not accepted will be brought in and treated like family on that day. We're told that God will signal that day both in history at the time of Christ and the future day with a beautiful trumpet. Trumpets in the Old Testament had many purposes, but they always signaled the start of something amazing that God was going to do. They signaled the start of battle. They signaled the time for temple worship. They announced the beginning of a feast. They announced the coronation of a new king. And they began to signal the beginning of God's final battle against evil. In that day, the trumpet will mark the final time for worship among God's people. See, God does not give up on rebellious people, but rather loves them and by grace gathers them to worship together. His wonderful grace is still available Again, this is a time in history, it is a time inaugurated by Jesus, and it is a day that has not yet come, which means if you are in this place, we believe this about you, that you're on purpose, and that God is using this passage and these people and this place to draw you to himself, which means the day of his grace is not yet over, that there is still time for you to be reconciled to him through the grace of Christ. For those who want to avoid the fate of the city of man and enjoy the beautiful fruit of the vineyard of God's people, there are two things you must believe and one thing you must do. First, you must believe that you yourself have no power to rescue yourself. You must take an honest assessment of God's holiness and admit your sinfulness. But do not worry, you're not alone in this place, for we all start here when we follow Jesus. The second thing you must believe is you must believe in the power of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection to atone for your sin. That Jesus endured the destruction that you deserve and has gifted you the life and reward that he did. If you're ready to believe these two things, today the final thing you must do is you must commit yourself to him. The Bible speaks of this in a bunch of different ways, but in each case it's clear it involves an act of our will in responding to God to say that we believe in Jesus and that we are ready to place himself in his hands. It is this loving discipline of God. I know what God's going on in your life, but I know that he's using it to draw you to himself. Will you allow yourself the freedom to experience his grace and love through that discipline today? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for being present in our midst through your word. Thank you for your powerful spirit, God, that inspired the imagination of Isaiah and put pen to parchment. Thank you for what you did in the context of history, God, that you have kept this promise that there is a day that we can look back to and mark on our calendars that you were faithful to what you said. And therefore, we live with hope that the day is coming once again when you too will remain faithful to what you've said. God, we pray for the fortified city of man. 
that they would have eyes to see how the things that they've built, the devices they've come up with to strengthen themselves against you will one day fall. And God, I pray for the vineyard of your church. Will you continue to water it and protect it? Will you continue to do all that is necessary to produce life? God, I pray for every soul in this room that they would know your grace and experience your mercy and that you would call them home to yourself. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.